the talk show with published authors, writers, and content creators discussing both the creative and technical sides of writing, as well as the industry surrounding it, from novels to screenplays to comics and more. And now, here's your host, author Travis I. Sivart. Well, thank you, Cogsley. And good evening. I almost said morning. I don't know where the hell my head is out. John, how are you? Um, tonight, on right night, and by the way, it is April 4th, 2020, so 442020, if you're a numbers person. And there's Princess Shara saying hello, dropping in. Uh, we are going to talk about genre jumping and initiate hazing. Or I guess it could be read as initiate hazing, either way. I am Travis Sivart. I'm your host. I'm the author. Actually, you know what I want to talk about today? Tara, right there in the uh, center of your guy's screen, is the editor of my latest book, Silver and Smith in the Jazir's Light, and she has returned it to me. I have begun doing the cleanup from her edits, as well as making a few other changes that um, I've discussed with a few beta readers. But I also cleaned up the first mm, 10 pages, which... And sent it to an agent. Which, by the way, let me say, for any agents out there, do not put 10 pages ever again. Ever again. <laughs> Please give me a word count, because depending on my spacing, my font size, etc., what, what, <laughs> you're a professional. Give me a word count. <laughs> uh, 2,500 words. <laughs> no, well, I, maybe. Um... <laughs> And hello, everybody, uh, Spacey. Let me go around, and we're going to just go clockwise as I normally so do. So directly above me there is Aaron Kennedy. Tell him a little bit about yourself and what prizes they've won, sir. All right. Uh, I'm Aaron Kennedy. I'm the author of the Ships of Valor series. Uh, I've been a technical writer for 25-some-odd years, currently working on my Ph.D. and writing articles that are related to that. Uh, right now it's going to be uh, on the military general orders and their leadership uh, implica uh, implications I I implicating our leaders them too okay very good and in the center of the screen we do have Tara and Tara you're just a little bit low can, in, in visual if you could drop your camera just about an inch not too much that's good there you go that's more centered right. up tell them who you are and what you do and why you're here All right. my name is Tara Moeller I am the Dreamer in Chief at Dream Punk Press. Um, and this is our latest pub, Waiting for Normal by Zara Johns. It's a, a teen contemporary, but a young girl who is um, diagnosed with cancer. And during the treatment, it's the whole waiting for life to get back to normal. So it kind of explores some of, of those themes and some of the issues there. And it is last and Wednesday, and there are 10 author signed copies waiting for the first 10 folks to buy it at dreampunkpress.com. It also feels like it can relate a lot to the current world in a weird, <laughs> weird way. Possibly. Possibly, yeah, yes. So there's something, guys. Now, in the upper right-hand corner of everybody's screen, we have the awesome, incredible, and delightful Michael Thompson. Hello, everyone. My name's Michael Thompson. I'm an author of fantasy and superhero books, and one of my books is Winslow Hoffner's Incredible Encounters. It's a folkloric fantasy on the high seas about cryptids, sea monsters, and epic urban legends that few have beheld. But there's one man who's seen them all. I just released the uh, ebook version of this book not too long ago. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, the viewers here because uh, this is the only place where I've uh, been mentioning uh, stuff recently. I haven't done a whole lot of marketing and I've been seeing the, uh, the sales go up digitally for the first time in a long time. So thank you so much. That is incredible, Michael. I am thrilled to hear that. And guys, don't forget, if you are picking up any of the author's work here, make sure you go throw them a review. Um, Amazon is always a great place to do it. You can give reviews even if you didn't purchase it at that place. You can throw it on Goodreads. You can throw it on Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, wherever you want, or all of them. And copy paste the same review. Put it in all of them if you want. It just helps us a lot. It's like giving us a tip after enjoying the book. Okay, help us out. Now, let's pop down to the lower right corner because she is a little low. And always right, we have Tempe. 
Hi, I'm Tempe Wade. I am the author of the Timely Revolution book series, a continuous time travel adventure series based during the Revolutionary War. Um, books one through four are currently out. Book one is actually on sale for 99 cents on Amazon. I lowered the price during all of our stay at home time. Um, books one through four are out, five and six are coming, and so are seven, eight, and nine. Awesome. Tempe, do me a favor. Tap your mic or rub your mic for me. You'll need to switch that to the other microphone, please. It's okay. A, I know you know how to do that. Sorry we didn't do that before the show. Now, just so everybody knows, if you're listening to this in one of the eight or so places we put the podcast up, don't forget you can always join us live every Saturday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Well, Eastern Time. Let's just go with Eastern. And that's at twitch.tv slash Travis Tavern Talk. Now, for those of you joining us live, don't forget any of the live broadcasts we have. Thank you, Tracy. Appreciate that. In the structured shows, you can pick them up on, just look below the screen. You'll see all the podcasting stuff. Other than that, thank you guys for showing up, which is the most important way to support us. It's showing up. It's spreading the word. It's bringing your friends much as we love to have that book sale or that subscription or Patreon, whatever, showing up first and foremost, so important. Um, just please keep six feet away. That's all <laughs> I can say right now. <clears throat> it's a, I have stories. Uh, <laughs> really, even, even when the world isn't going crazy, please stay six feet away. There is no reason you need to be much closer than that to me, ever. <laughs> Unless we're going to make out or whisper secrets to each other. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or maybe the both. Um, so tonight's topics, Tempe, I'm going to pick on you. You comfortable with that? Yes. Is my mic better? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, okay. I'm going to pick on Tempe because both the topics for our first hour, creative hour, and our second hour, the technical hour, were inspired by Tempe. Because as I've pointed out, Tempe is actually the newest writer amongst us. Perhaps, especially if we do the word count over the amount of time, probably the most prolific amongst us. And probably doing as well, if not better, sales-wise than a lot of us. But she's still the newest. So there is there's a reason I have all these different people, so we have different points of views, different level of experience in different areas. And Tempe's asked a few questions. Now, for the first one, the first half, the creative hour, we're going to talk about genre jumping, which is something near and dear to my heart. Now, first thing I'll tell you is whether you're an actor, whether you're a writer, whether you're a restaurant or whatever, people say brand yourself. Choose the thing you're good at. Now, for writers, that's pick a genre. Is Stephen King suddenly put out a romance novel, a lot of people be like, what the? I don't know what just happened. And they go nuts. They go crazy. It's horrible. They, they're, their world is wrecked. Just like if Metallica put out a K-pop album. Okay? It's just... <laughs> How dare they? That's wrong. I have two of them, sir. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> I'm out of the loop. <laughs> so what I want to do is go around and talk about what genres we have written. And I'm going to start with Tempe, and then go to Aaron, and then we'll go to the others, because I kind of know how the trickle-down goes. So we're going to kind of start narrow and go wide. Tempe, what genres have you written in? Okay, uh, the Timely Revolution book series is actually a combination. It's a combination of historical fiction mm -hmm. and fantasy. So I'm, I've kind of got my foot in both doors Anyway, um, there's no, romance, there's, good, right? there's romance in it as well. Um, so it, it's it's kind of a, a mixture. It's a lot of Celtic lore. It's a mixture of everything. So I've kind of got my foot in several doors already. Mm -hmm. um, but and we'll get to it later. But where we're talking mm -hmm. about, I was looking at streamlining some offshoots. Is what I've been working on doing. Oh, now, that's even. Uh, Hearing that, that's cool. Aaron, go on. Uh, now, and I apologize, I have not had a chance to read yours yet. Now, when you say it's got romance in it, it's romance as a theme, not romance as a genre. We're not talking 
sweaty man on cover, freaking shirtless. Uh, well, romance. you could. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> well, let's bump up those sales. <laughs> no, from There's the a lot of it in there. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. From some of the people I talk to, I think it's more of a perception, Aaron, for her book. Mm -hmm. I've had some people say, this is a romance novel. Okay. It, with historical context and a time travel thrown in. So I think Where it depends on... Her, mm -hmm. Right, what direction you're reading from. And as Tempe has said, she's okay. had a lot of men read and enjoy the book because yeah. the historical context. So I think they're reading the same book from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And I will say, I never started out to write a romance mm -hmm. with this. The you don't romance, have to lie to us. Romance, <laughs> romance is an element, and uh, especially in book two and throughout all of it. But it's not how it started out. It started out as historical kind of fiction fantasy thing. And this just happened to be a part of it because it's like real life. So, And I did write down a note of something I think we'll have fun talking about is trying to pick what genre your damn book falls into when you're listing it somewhere. Oh, God. I, and, and we're going to come back and look at, a, look at everybody just go, oh. So, yes, <laughs> it's, it's, everybody's head dropped, dipped, and wobbled like a bobblehead. Um, Aaron, <laughs> genres you've written in, sir. Okay, uh, my primary fiction genre it would be, it's pulp, uh, but it's loosely military sci-fi. By the or, way, a little love for uh, pulp. Just fun, quick, good. <laughs> and and that's exactly why I did it. Um, I've also written in the urban sci-fi um, category, or urban fantasy um, realm. Um, and then uh, high fantasy, I've got a few uh, few things out there in that. And then, of course, all my technical writing stuff, right. um, which is just a, a completely different vein. Um, is there genre differentiations in technical writing? Oh, Tara, yeah. And Tara, you can sing along with this song, please. Go ahead. So, like, what okay. genres? Can you name, like, three big ones? Oh, shoot. You've got opinion pieces, uh, mm -hmm. which is where I kind of sway into. Uh, or editorials, right? Um, and then we get into the hard technical writing, which is manuals, and then everything kind of in between. Okay. Um, but Tara can definitely uh, go into much more detail than I can on that. And Tara, when we get to you, please go ahead and just you know give a little peck at that to educate me. Okay. Because that's a beautiful. I love that we all know different things, that we're not on the same level in all the places. Some places we, but. I just love the fact that I have you guys here who can teach me something, too. Um, Aaron, did you have anything more? You good? No, no, no. Uh, I'm good here. Okay. And Tempe, I totally didn't ask if you had anything more. Were you finished? I apologize. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm good. Okay. Now, who should go next? Michael or Tara? Because I know Tara, I think Tara's written more... You know what, Michael? Let's go with you. Okay. Uh... Let's see. Each of my books kind of has like two or three categories, um, kind of intersectional. Uh, Chicken Boy is a superhero book, so I kind of call that a genre. I don't know if it is. It's action adventure and it's humor. And now that'd be considered um, middle grade, right? Or not? Middle for the age group, it's middle grade. Okay. Yeah, it's nine to twelve. Um, for for World of Your Young Adult is kind of like a genre, even though it's an age group. Um, but as young adult, um, portal fantasy is the term I became familiar with and I liked using Wait, for marketing that purposes. Yeah. Cause I, you didn't know that? <laughs> I, I'll touch on that in a minute. Go use, ahead. Use that for portals. It's, it's use that fantasy for a lot of where, stuff, um, yeah, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's a type of genre where, uh, real world characters encounter, uh, alternate world, um, a little wood it could also be called like secondary world um and then uh winslow was a unique one i think i mentioned last show that i had to kind of come up with a new genre to kind of market it market for it i called it folkloric fantasy um but it's kind of i get I, in terms of the existing genres uh urban fantasy is something that comes up a lot so where whereas portal fantasy is uh real world characters in an alternate um, space, urban fantasy is fantasy elements woven into or hidden within the real world. So that's that's kind of where Winslow falls. But 
at the same time that it tends to be like werewolves and stuff for urban fantasy like like those those more classic things um more classic monsters but yeah those are my those are my categories i've done a fair bit of genre jumping <laughs> Tara. oh my gosh okay so we all know <laughs> that i write um victorian and steampunk um as eg gaddis and that's a ya so young adult for teens um and then i also write um under my own name and I have a whole bunch of stuff out under my real name. Um, some novellas that um, span from slightly mythical, which is the sacrifice. Um, then there's the desolation of fog, which is uh, slightly spiritual, religious, metaphysical, weird. Um, I have some romantic sci-fi that I've written for anthologies um, and that uh, what's new what happens on Destiny 2 will be a free download from dreampunkpress.com next week so I've, I've written um, in a lot of different genres um, let me touch on the whole technical editing different genres that you asked me to do um, you have, again, you have technical manuals, technical reports, you have technical articles, um, and then within that, a medical article is technical, vice an engineering article that is technical, vice even a marketing article can be technical, and yet it's on a, what people would not think to be a technical realm, but if you're talking the technical aspects of marketing, um, that's a, another subgenre within there. And you can have everything from a recipe um, to the instructions on how to put a cabinet together. Those are technical writing. So, I mean, it spans everything. So, gotcha. and if you want to talk <laughs> the difficulty of genres, try going into Bowker's and My Identifiers and right. then trying to figure out where your book goes. Yeah. Uh, because guess what? Everything from Age zero to age 19 is all children's literature. Mm -mm, yeah. In Bowker. So while out in the real world, it's broken up from early readers to early chapter books to middle grade to younger YA to younger Y or to older YA and then even into the new adult with all the different subgenres in there. Um, you know, the in some ways, the business hasn't adapted to that yet. And it can make it really hard. Oh, yeah. It's one of those friggin' uh, we're looking at when we group by demographic, we got target audience, which is not really a genre. It's just a target audience mm -hmm. because, um, well, shoot, going back to like the comic books and things like that, that is a target audience. But they've got all genres throughout yeah. that. Uh, the yeah. Fantastic Four is a completely different book than the X-Men, which is a completely different book than the Punisher. Um, and even Wolverine was a completely different tone than the X-Men books. Um and but they're all got the same target demographic. Do they though? Do you think yeah. Punisher is the same as Archie? <laughs> At the time, yes. No, never. Uh, no, never. It's, it's spread out a lot more now, yeah. but it, it is definitely. And <clears throat> here's what I'm going to tell you about genres, and then I'm going to talk about my stuff here. Uh, genres are subjective, and they change as the times change. And what I will tell you about life is we go too detailed and then we consolidate as a society, as a species. We spread it out and try to micro-categorize, realize there's too many damn things to even wrap our heads around anymore. Simplify that crap. And this is what we see happening now. We're on the micro expansion right now where we're, we're hyper-detailing things and it will come back together. Uh, Princess Shiara has a comment here. Says I agree with Tara. It took me a while to see exactly how I could would categorize after I started the process. Still surprising when you end up finding the genre you didn't think you'd write for. The genres I've written for have been to go with the basic ones. I've done sci-fi, fantasy, horror. Um, to get a little more specific, I have done steampunk, cyberpunk, dystopian, uh, no utopian, apocalyptic. I have done speculative fiction, I have done urban fantasy, I have done 
and so on, and so on, and so on. And I can say I have done children's, I have done middle grade, I have done young adult. Again, it depends where you're pulling from and whatnot. And I can throw my stuff to three different publishing houses, and they might all categorize it differently. Um, mm -hmm. The thing you said about Porto Fantasy, Michael, this is what I've been reading since my teen. It seemed like every time I picked up a new author, it had portals, and I didn't realize this. I didn't seek it out. It's just what it came to me. It was sent to me by whatever power. And yeah. it, it's a it's concept a I have been fascinated with, and when the Internet first came into normal people's hands, it's one of the first things I started looking for, and nobody seemed to know, not just in fantasy, but yeah. the actual scientific study, which... Study the Large Hadron Collider. Matter of fact, you'll see that commentary come up in Silver and Smith. Um, secondary world, I'm glad you said that because as I was researching agents this afternoon, I heard that term and I'm like, I don't even know what that yeah. is. Just like people like, oh. Alice in Wonderland. It's secondary world, okay. Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah. So, I think, I think, at least, you know, it's, it's at least something that involves building a new world. Um, but I know Portal Fantasy is taking uh, characters from our world and putting it in a new world. It's a, And it's a matter of, if I can, again, ramble on for another moment here, guys. Um, here's mm -hmm. what I'll tell you about specialized genres. People might go, well, not that many people are looking for that. No, not as many people are searching that term, that genre, as they are, let's say, fantasy or horror, the broad spectrum, science fiction. But you have a very niche, hungry, devoted following in those smaller genres. So you're basically like, well, do you want to throw your fishing line in the middle of the ocean and hope for something, or do you want to go to a pond where you're only going to catch one kind of fish, but you know you're going to catch something? And there's your choices. Yeah, you have a larger chance of a bigger fish in the ocean. But do you want to be guaranteed to eat, or do you want to maybe get the big one? And that's... Well, it, it, Go ahead. Oh, uh, well, th that's one of the reasons, like, if you're looking at Amazon, you'll have three different listings on there. Uh, and depending on what you're doing, you want to get those rankings up as high as possible on each of your listings. Uh, just using... Uh, a friend of mine's book, as an example, he's got uh, fleet science fiction, space marine science fiction, space opera science fiction, uh, and he's like 24, 20, and 29 across those three things. But on the bestseller ranks across the board, he's like 4305. Now, that's right. a lot of numbers, but what he's trying to do is get high, as high on rankings in each of the genres that he's picked. That's true. Um, and it's not necessarily what you think it is it's what you think is mark marketable because this is a business decision on this side it's creative of what you're going to write because you're trying to write to trope and things like that but in reality we're trying to sell books and yeah. you got to pick the right category to sell your book and if it's romance uh in tempe's case historical fiction uh romance is going to get her a lot of the women and uh people that like that side historical fiction um, that's going to be a completely different demographic, but that Venn diagram of we want it big. Yeah, there's going to be overlap, but we want that as big of a pond as possible with, as you said, Travis, the best hit rate inside that pond. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. What's great about the Amazon categories is that you can pick up to 10 per book, uh, per format of book. So like mm -hmm. uh, Tempe, you know, you've got lots of different genre types within the same thing. Right. Um, I think a category in Amazon is time travel. It is. So you grab it, that. When did it grab, change okay. to 10? It, you, as of like last October, it was two. It's, three. I think it was three. No, last time I was in there. But you have to call. The only way to do it is to call. Ah, I did not know that. Okay. For yourself, uh, if you're doing it yourself, you get two. If you call them, they can add up to 10. I did well, not know that. And, and see, because I, I always wondered, how are the people getting these off the wall, yeah, you know, listings? I'm like, by email. Okay. And, but you have to, what you have to do is the path. 
and I can tell you more about that later. Yeah, let's want. let's pull that aside for for a later point. Um, what I'm going to go mm -hmm. back to Aaron's Venn diagram. If you guys are picking genres, allow me to suggest, and then you can tell me how it works out. Go ahead and choose a very specific genre. If you're just doing the two or three that Amazon allows, and you're not going this this other way that I really want to know about, um, choose a broad spectrum one, a wide audience one. And choose a smaller, very focused audience one. I, I would think logically that's going to give you the best give and take and balance. Um, and well, you, go ahead. You also want uh, something that that are different as well. Yes. So uh, using your thing uh, and just in my own book as an example on my on my physical copy of the book, I've got literature and science fiction. And those are my big my big picture ones. Um, but on the Kindle edition, um, I chose up as military sci-fi, um, and space opera are yeah, the right. two, two much more tailored sides uh, to your point. Yeah. Kindle so, has its own categories and they tend to be more focused. Um, they no longer have their own categories because Kindle and create space, the two Amazon things are one now. But uh, they're treated as two separate books. I mean, I'm literally pulling it off their Amazon site right now. Actually, no, you are correct, because you go in and do one, then the other, and you... Um, now, how it used to be, I haven't done one since, or else if I did do one since they combined, it was one September, October of last year. But you would uh, choose two categories in each. But we're not going to worry about that, because there's a lot more than just oh, yeah. Amazon. Let's back it away from those specifics to the actual generalized topic, because okay. Tempe is exploring writing in what she feels is a different genre. Now, of course, there's bleed over, as she has pointed out. Let me ask you directly, just out of my curiosity, not necessarily to create a tangent out of this. Tempe, is this kind of a offshoot or a spin-off of your current series? Completely separate. Completely is there different. Any has nothing way to way the two worlds are going to tie together down no. the road? Okay. No, the reason I ask is, this. it doesn't matter if it does. But some readers really love it. And with the, because Portals is something that's in yours. Uh, not, no spoilers, sorry. I, I Hopefully that's not too much to give away to people. I'm only like 10 pages in. Hang on. <laughs> but there's promise. And, and you've insinuated so, things in the characters in the story that I've already read. And I like what I'm seeing here. Um, and Portals do fall in there. I mean, you use that word. <laughs> I so, did. I did. So I with did. something like that, it is quite possible, considering you have the fae and the celtic lore and then portals um mm -hmm. so now we've discussed what we have here as genres that we've done now tara i'm going to start with you if you don't mind oh oh what is i was saying by the way branding 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 and, and hello go kenny good to see you it's been a while pardon us while we uh talk about right night and the topics that we have if you have any questions or any comments regarding the topic, please feel free to shout those out there, and I'll read off the chat. I do have a bell here. I usually ding. Sometimes I just interrupt when it's my turn. So, branding. A smart restaurant specializes. You know if you're going to get burgers or seafood or specifically sushi or if you're a heavy metal band, you're not going to put out some country tunes um, and all this, and they recommend this for writers also. Right in one Cheesecake genre. Factory. What's that? Cheesecake Factory. Hey. <laughs> um, so, and they say this is smart branding. I am a moron brander because I love different genres. I don't want to write in one. Now, I've broken it up into certain pen names for my children's books, for my adult humor, and for pretty much everything else. And I did this so somebody, and it's no secret what my pen names are. But I did this so somebody doesn't buy a children's book, go, this is great, get another one of these books for my kid. And they pick up my apocalyptic fantasy that has zombies and demons and very bad things. <laughs> uh, so, uh... Yeah, you're going back to that... I, I talked to you guys before about I've done a romance. I've been working on some romance stuff. That is tied back into the original series. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to do some stuff that goes back into it. But this stuff, this new thing is something totally, totally 
off the wall. It's totally new for me. So that's why I kind of got you guys to look at it and say, hey, what do you think? So what are your fears a... here, Tempe? What was it you were trying to get us to help you with by showing it to us? Um, You know, I'm, I've never been a huge fantasy reader i'm starting mm -hmm. to get more into it mostly because i've been at home and there's a lot of fantasy stuff out there now you've been watching, watching henry it on cavill Netflix. we know you know <laughs> i'm gonna watch henry cavill no matter what he's in <laughs> now that i know who he is <laughs> you gotta get henry cavill on the show <laughs> oh man oh, I, God, I you, if anybody knows henry cavill i, I need an introduction <laughs> And, and for the for the people who are out there who don't know, who, the others have heard me say this, I had no idea who this man was, that he was Superman, until I watched The Witcher and looked him up. I had no idea who he was. And a lot more than just Superman. He's actually done quite a quite an array yeah. of things and quite Mission a selection Impossible. of things. What's that, Aaron? But I didn't know who he was. Oh, Mission Impossible, he was one of yes. the villains. Yes, that was on today, actually. So yeah. <laughs> He got the whole collection. I, I'm the only person in the world who did not know who this man was. I'm telling you, it's it's crazy. But since I've been watching more fantasy stuff, because that's what's basically on Netflix, uh, since we've been stuck inside, um, that's kind of got me curious to exploring something a little bit different now. And it looks like that's what people enjoy. You know, they they like the the more that fantasy involved in something, the more they enjoy it. So figured I'd give it a shot. Got nothing else to do, so. Very good. So, what are your fears and concerns? Why aren't you just jumping in both feast first into a new genre? What are you worried about? And I ask this so we can address that and support that and tell you, it'll be okay. <laughs> Go do that. Well, again, I, again I, I've never been a huge fantasy reader. Not, not in the way, like, the type of stuff like The Witcher. The stuff, you know, the, the real different fantasy world type things um and so it's all new to me so i'm not even sure what's out there i i may be writing something that's already out there i don't know so i'm i'm just trying to kind of get a feel for you know if i'm even going in the right direction here don't worry about that okay because keep in mind a lot of the stories already exist and they're just they're re they're reskinned um because right. Let's see. The Matrix is Star Wars. They're the same. The first Matrix and the first Star Wars, Episode Four. Um, they're the same movie. They've got the same points and uh, plot points that ha happen, and you go, "Oh, okay, we're good." So even if something's already out there, you're telling it in a new and different way, and that's what matters. Yeah, and and again, I don't want to beat a dead horse either. I don't want to rehash something that's already been rehashed. 500 times uh, it um, has but... comfort to it if it's recognizable that's true so mm -hmm. it's true. it's a balance and you're valid in that concern but also if you do it right it's it's a new view it's a new take it's it's comfort food at worst yes uh, uh, and you know that you know what works with it uh, true. Uh, it's one of those uh, a bug's life that's samurai seven or the seven samurai Magnificent Seven. They're all the same movie. It's just done. Uh, Lion King is Hamlet. Right. <laughs> uh, and they, we know what, there's a reason they steal from Shakespeare, because all of this stuff works. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> the, the path's already kind of been laid there, so, yeah. yeah. So, Tempe, here's what I'm going to tell you, and then I want to move over to Mike and Tara here and let them throw some advice and opinions at you here. Um, okay. I love to write in different genres just because I like those different settings. The setting can be a character as much as the spaceship or the person's favorite car or the cop's gun that means so much to him or the army man's uh, utility knife, etc. Thank you, Chris, for those bits. I appreciate that. And by the way, for our moderators, if you see somebody just being disruptive within chat, please... Feel free to time them out, feel free to whisper them and tell them to cut it out, or feel free to just ban them. It's okay. Um, and thank you guys for doing that, especially while I'm running one of these type of shows where it's a little less freeform and more structured. Okay, I started out writing fantasy, like, at age 14. And I didn't want to write anything else. Now, as time went on, 
and I started publishing, I did more steampunk because that's where people were coming at me going, can you do this? Do you want to do this? I'm like, yes. And because of that, I have now written detective stories, Cthulhu, Lovecraftian horror, all in a steampunk skin. Um, and that's the other thing. You're going to find one genre and paint it with the palette of another genre. As such as you did, you've got historical fiction that maybe has a romance skin. Or maybe it's a romance novel with a historical fiction skin. Or maybe it's a fantasy. You get the idea. You blend, as you've mentioned, your multiple genres right. for what you've already done. There is no genre you can't do. Here's what I'll tell you. People connect with the characters. You will draw different people who think they like this genre. I don't like legal, but wow, does John Grisham write a great book. On the other hand, quick side note and tangent, um, I'm listening to Dean Kuhn's book on audiobook right now. Not the writer I remember when I read his books 20, 25 years ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, really not. Uh, he is hugely successful. Who am I to talk? But, yeah, just not as smooth as I remember. Kind of clunky and chunky. Uh, part of it's showing what can be done. So, I mean, he did a lot of that, him and the... Stephen King did a lot of that way back when, and then people kind of copied the formula. Um, and now they've smoothed it out so much more than these guys did. Um, it's not that they were bad in 1990, but they wouldn't be published today. Right. Or wouldn't be as popular today. John says, with our comics, our usual issue is kids worrying too much that their work is like something else, and it tends to stagnate their creativity. This is what I've told people... Read the other books, watch the TV shows, watch the movies, read the articles, read the reviews. You are not going to consciously plagiarize. And even if you do pull elements or ideas or thoughts or whatever, it's going to create a familiarity. Uh, I'm going to use Silver and Smith because that's the one I'm, I'm editing. It's in my head right now. In the opening chapter, we all remember Indiana Jones with Toss Me the Whip. Toss me the idol. Indiana Jones tosses in the idol. Guy drops the whip, walks away. Um, I have a scene very similar to that in the opening chapter where different circumstances, different things, but there's definitely a familiarity to it that most people are going to go, huh, and I'm okay with that association. Matter of fact, I'm happy to have that association because it automatically tells my reader, this is the thing you can expect. This is a right. feel you're going to yeah. get. And that's where familiarity can be a step up. It's not a direct rip-off of the scene. Okay, but I digress. You don't hesitate to rewrite something you've seen before in your own way, in your own words. Because life is repetitive. Tara, right. how do you go from genre to genre? Do you have a gear shifting? Is there a different mindset? Because for me, I just explained... It's just a different color paint in the same room. Um, my genre jumping depends on the story I want to tell. Um, I'll get an idea, and a lot of times um, it doesn't fit with um, other things that I have written in the past. Um, I'm lucky that a lot, you know, I've had six ideas that fit for E.G. Gaddis. Um, and so that, you know, and that's actually a little bit of branding going on there. Whereas everything else, I just dump under, for the most part, under Tara Muller. Um, because I've got a ghost stories and, a, you know, a bunch of different things in there. Didn't realize I wrote horror until somebody read something and, and told me it was, and I didn't consider it horror. Because I consider horror like Stephen King, which I can't read. Still can't. I get about three pages in and wet my pants and that's enough. Well, um, I also with horror feel like there's so, psychological horror, suspense horror, and then gore horror. Oh, right. freaking yeah. Alfred Hitchcock was great about some of that. Yeah. Um, but just, you know, to, to mention something that, that you did um, there, Travis, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Um, so if you're picking, you know, if you, if you found inspiration, in something that somebody else has done. Um, don't be scared of that. That's, that's a great thing. That's where a lot of our creativity comes from to begin with. 
um, is we're inspired by something, we've seen something we've heard, uh, something we've smelled, whatever, whether it's a real story that, you know, we know that's happened from our real, uh, from our life, or whether it's, you know, we watch Witcher and go, ooh, I, I like this, I, I kind of have my own form of thing. Um, and Tempe, since I've read the Timely Revolution series, um, as far as I have so far, um, and that snippet, there are elements of your style in both of those, okay? Mm-hmm. And don't be, um, I think there are other story elements that, you know, I, if you keep writing this, which I want to because I want to read the whole thing. <laughs> um, yeah, you've already grabbed me in that <laughs> little bit. Um, I want, I want you, I guess what I want you to realize is that it's still yours. And there's the Tempe Wade genre. Okay, yeah. We all, all have something in our writing that is something that goes through all of it that um, someone can, can look at it and read it and go, oh, wait a minute. I know who this is. Um, there are some... It's the author's voice. Authors. Yeah. In, in some ways. Or there, and sometimes it's not always the author's voice because if you take, say, Jane Ann Krantz and Amanda Quick, it's the same person. Jane Ann Krantz writes both of those. I love Amanda Quick stuff, um, especially when I was a, a teenager and into my young adult. Um, and when I realized that they were the same author, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go pick up one of these Jane Ann Krentz books. Didn't enjoy it, but I still looked, and there were still little elements in there that I'm like, if I had not known it was, I would get uh, either she read Amanda Quick or Amanda Quick read her because there were little elements in there that are the, the little tells, just like if you're a card player, you know, you're playing your poker and you've got a tell. Um, authors have tells too. So um, just remember that, you know, there's also, like I said, the, the Tempe Wade genre. Um, and there are little elements in there of your storytelling, even in those snippets that you've given us, that your reader is not going to be scared if you are suddenly writing in a different genre. Because those little elements that drew them to the Time of the Revolution series in the first place, they're going to find in this one too. So they, be- us- they usually involve inappropriate thoughts, but <laughs> that's okay. And you know, actually, what Tara is saying there is, if you look some of the stuff. Now, I haven't read Timely Revolution, um, and the more we talk about what? it, the more I'm, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it, what you're writing now is much more up my interest line. Um, what, what I've read of the little bit, which is one reason I'm like, ooh, do that, because that's more of my thing. It's my shtick. Um, but looking at what you said about Timely Revolution, especially moving forward with Finn and whatnot, and the Fae, and the fuckery, and all that stuff. <laughs> and Michael, we are so getting to you in just a minute, buddy. You're doing a great job <laughs> waiting for your turn. I'm passing oh, I'm, it to you. I'm, I'm just fascinated. <laughs> um, and do yes. keep in mind, without the headset, make sure you lean forward when you go to talk. You're good right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm chilling. <laughs> but Tempe, you you have elements that are similar in both books, even in just the few pages you've written of the new stuff, if you continue with it. And that is going to show. And if you look at Stephen King, he doesn't have much by way of series. you got The Dark Tower, then you got Shining and Doctor Sleep, but... So he might connect a couple books, Dark Tower being the exception to the rule. So there is nothing wrong with you writing your Anchor series and then branching out. Um, Look at Michael right there, who has three series, and this is where I'm going to bounce over to you, Michael. He has three series of very different genres. And let's talk about that. Why three genres? Do you have to do a mental shift to go from one to the other? And anything else that you've picked up as we're talking, Michael, that you want to go over? Um, yeah, having three genres, uh, is really, I, I, I've decided to like, kind of like cut it, cut it off there for now until I finish one of these series, um, and never do more than I've decided that I'm going to have chicken boy running in the background, um, do like a series of novellas every time and then, and, and then go into world of the orb. Um, but I think what Tara said is brilliant. I think, um, like the Tempe Wade genre the Travis of art genre, the E.G. Gaddis, Tara Moeller genre, the Aaron uh, Kennedy genre. You know, we all have, um, if we do do multiple genres, 
our writing style is going to be like the uniting factor. And I think as indies, it's a little bit more okay for us to um, to do multiple genres. I think if like say we got we like lightning struck and then one one genre got really or one of one book that we did got really huge blew up um you might want to focus on that one hmm. um or like your audience may be kind of kind of weirded out if you, if you stray from the thing that like blew up so much um but for us i think it's i think it's cool and and i, I think there are positive aspects to casting a big net and then seeing like seeing which, which thing like really resonates with people or maybe they all equally resonate with people and they just like your writing style um and you're just hitting different different parts of the uh reader pool so if you're writing if you're writing if you are more familiar with one style and you're going into another genre uh you just kind of want to ask yourself what would your version of that genre look like because you know your Sorry your to um, michael if i may please chris thank mm -hmm. you for that and i want to say congratulations to princess shira aaron michael the gray cat and matthew yukilson and and forgive me if i get any of the names wrong on that one for becoming a subscriber thanks to chris cavalon right there who just gifted mm -hmm. Five, bringing his total to Thanks, 50. Chris. That is awesome, Chris. Thank you so much for that. Here's to your face, and here's to all our new subscribers, including, uh, yeah, two right here on the show. So <laughs> 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 thank you, guys. Appreciate that. Awesome. Michael, please carry on. Uh, thank you for letting me interrupt with that. That is a... No problem. That uh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, ask yourself, what would your version of this genre look like? Like, what what are you looking for? What What's the Tempe Wade version of fantasy? So, um, like, and, and what are the different ratios that you really want to turn? Which dials do you want to turn to max? Which What do you want to de-emphasize? Like, what's your favorite thing when you watch The Witcher? Like, is there anything you want to homage? I think... Oh, yeah, there is. Well, we all know what that is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I did see a meme recently... Uh, and for anybody who's listening to this five or ten years after our broadcast, we are in the midst of coronavirus blossoming in the U.S. It, you know, April 2020, just the beginning. So the next couple weeks will be very interesting for us. But I saw a meme that says, uh, don't knock on my door unless if you're George Clooney, Matthew McConaughey, and there was one other name, or one of those firefighters holding a puppy that we see on the calendars. <laughs> So I guess Henry Cavill would be on that little short list there for you. The very short list. I don't celebrity crush much, <laughs> but <laughs> just well, when, I <laughs> well, when I do. <laughs> it's a. We can just uh, imagine your husband weeping in the corner right now if Henry shows up. It's and what a name, Henry! Such an old-fashioned name yeah. for such a, well, he's a modern. British. Is he? Yes. And that explains. Yes, he is what okay so we got about 12 minutes left in this i want to give tempe a chance to talk a little bit but and i also want to give each of us after tempe has a chance to talk kind of a round robin to give that final advice as we hear her thoughts here tempe do you have some thoughts um yeah you know i think i, I the reason that i i kicked off on this fantasy thing was i kind of got stuck on the timely series so i needed something to change i need a, i needed to expand oh, my yeah i need to expand my horizons a little bit and just kind of step away um from i'm far enough on that series that you know i've got two years worth of stuff already written anyway type, yeah. so yeah so this this is something a little different we'll see where it goes you know it, it may go nowhere it it may do very well we'll see you don't know till you try so i agree um, Aaron, do you have some thoughts on this? Uh, no, like her, uh, it was one of those I kind of got stuck on book two of uh, 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 the Ships of Hour series, Politicus, uh, and I'm like, you know what, let me revisit one of my older works, um, and it is Urban Fantasy Romance uh, is the one I'm going towards. It's got about 15 pages or so done already, and then I'm going to uh, type that up and see if I can't get it to novella length. Do, do we get um, to read those first you will 15 absolutely pages? Absolutely. Not worried about the rest. I just want to see the first 15 when you're ready. 
Oh yeah, no, no, no. I just got to scan them in and put them up on Google Docs. They they're done uh, and prepped. Did you handwrite them in an, on like a legal pad? <laughs> no, no, friggin' I lost the thumb drive or disk that it was associated <laughs> with years ago, but I don't throw anything away. That's good. old school. <laughs> oh, and there's an there's another one. Uh, this is a high fantasy um, that I was looking at, but I was like, you know what? Let's do the urban fantasy first. I'm excited to hear that, Aaron, because, yeah, I've been bugging Aaron for years. Hey, so how's your writing going? How's your writing going? How's your writing going? Because, Aaron, I'm going to be cruel to you right here. I've read oh, Ships of Valor, and there is definitely room for improvement, but there's a good core seed of a good storytelling there. But anytime you have a first book or a 20th book, there is room for improvement. There's room for growth. There's room for expansion. Um, and there's oh, definitely yeah. that with Aaron, and I want to see that. And by the way, guys, thank e thank you all, each of you, for allowing me to criticize your work, hopefully showing the good and the bad, the strong points and the weak points from my point of view. Um, and the reason I thank you for that is because every time I'm allowed to do that with you, it does two things for me. First of all, it gives value to my opinion and my knowledge. And that's a wonderful thing, because otherwise, where do I get that feedback on my own opinion? Um, second of all, it allows me to be a little less nervous when I share with you, because you've already opened yourself to me. So when I share, we all get that anxiety of, <gasps> and also, hopefully, it, it lets you guys come at me critically and go, this could be stronger, this could be better, this is great, I love this, but this, let's talk about. Michael, you got some thoughts on uh, genre bending, jump, genre jumping? Um, I really liked what you said about uh, homages, Travis, because I, I do think that that's a great way to put a mental nugget in people's heads and uh, and connect it to other things without even realizing it. And it's just a cool and neat way to take things that um, have become classics for us and embed them in our works, and then maybe in the future they'll move forward and become the new classics i remember for uh winslow i did lots of spielberg uh homages and and one of them was there's in the middle of the book there's a letter that winslow sends to john when um there's this big disturbance in the bay and he <laughs> and he says that uh you're gonna need a bigger paper for this one <laughs> <laughs> so it's a reference to jaws and uh it's fun so yeah, have fun with it, and uh, whatever is, whatever story is populating your mind at the time is the one that's meant to be told, and it's just a matter of figuring out how you're going to tell your version of that genre. Tara. Um. Yeah. Read. Um. Watch. Um. Investigate. Research. Um. The different genres that. Um, you're interested in, um, not necessarily to see um, what is there to compare what you're going to do with, but just to get you familiar with the genre itself, some of the tropes, some of the uh, um, what's going on with it. Because then, um, you know, from a publishing standpoint, it helps you figure out where the heck what you've done fits. Because um, I do have a little bit of insight on the, the two um categories thing um but we can discuss that again offline but um and, and you know, i if suspect you're at this, if i'm as interrupt, a business yeah i suspect that whole thing with the multiple categories will come back as a topic in the future i just didn't want yeah. to dominate tonight with it tara yeah. please go on um but if you're looking at writing as a business which all of us here do um, you have to have a little bit of familiarity with um, any genre that you think you're going to write in. Uh, just to familiarize yourself with what's there. Um, because again, comps are what sell your book. It's like, you know, um, Silver and Smith is uh, Indiana Jones meets, I know you had said, Pirates of the Caribbean, um, Guardians of the Galaxy. Pirates of the Caribbean, Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, that's, that's what gets people to read your book. And often if you are spanning more than one genre, then you have two audiences. Um, 
I, I suspect, Tempe, that this fantasy of yours will have some romance in it, will probably have absolutely wonderful sex scenes in it. And, um, oh. and <laughs> For um, all the little old church ladies. More. <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah, and, and so the familiarization is um, kind of to help call some of your fears about that genre. So that you're familiar with it, and then you can play with it and do with it what you want. So. Can I, can I just say I hate writing sex scenes? <laughs> oh, tell me about it. <laughs> you know, I despise then, writing. Then you don't <laughs> have to if you don't. Writing <laughs> is editing. Yeah. Sex scenes. I'm like the whole time going, oh my god, should I write this? <laughs> well, my advice for that would be either just accept it and do it. Have a good time with it. Yeah. Or stop whoa, doing whoa, whoa. it. <laughs> <laughs> or so go ahead and just... A good time with it? Yeah, I, I make sure the characters have a good time with yeah. it. <laughs> but you can also stop. You can say, and they fell together closing. Um, no, I wouldn't have the same effect, I don't think. Tara, would. what do you think? <laughs> now, my thoughts on this topic here. Um... First of all, yes, study your tropes. I have heard a lot of new writers going, well, I don't want the tropes. No, tropes are necessary. Those are the the sightseeing expectations of that journey of the tourist that is your reader. If you don't have these, it is flawed and missing something. Now, you can be totally original and creative, but I recommend you do that after you have an audience. Um <laughs> Doing that right away out of the gate, it's hard to grab an audience because you have no reference points to go, this is what you can look for and expect. There are certain things. If you take Star Wars, Aaron mentioned Matrix, blah, 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 blah. Star Wars is the King Arthur legend, retold. You have a wizard, you have a young farm boy, you have a magic sword, you have a black knight. Um... And there are certain tropes that lend itself, though that space opera, they're actually using fantasy tropes in there. Um, also, don't, if you write a little bit on this and you're done and you put it down, still expect our support in that decision. This might be an exercise for you. You might go, oh, I don't actually want to do this. I just needed something to cleanse my palate. And I want to write something totally different than that or what I currently have out or whatever. Um, let's see here. I haven't walked away from an idea yet, so. <laughs> I have. It's not easy. <laughs> um, usually what happens is I'll end up getting a handful of ideas and be able to put them together into one. So I don't actually that's walk it. away. I incorporate it into a larger picture thing. Other than that, I think that's it, but let me tell you what, I hate it when people abbreviate middle grade as MG, because I always think Ma Magic the Gathering, the card game. <laughs> yeah, that's a side note. Now, it is almost the midpoint of the show, the top of the hour. Does anybody need to take a quick break? Just to refill a soda. Go to mute yes. yourself, guys. If you yeah. do, step away. I'm going to talk to our viewers. If you're sticking around, feel free to jump in on this. Um... Guys, I really appreciate you showing up. I appreciate you bringing your friends. The growth is amazing and incredible, whether it's here on the live show at twitch.tv slash Travis Tavern Talk, or whether it's on the podcast across the board in all the places I put them. Um, folks who show up and add to the show, such as John of Conquest Publishing there, who is a comic book publisher and many other things. Spacey Tracy, who is just super supportive, and Michael's mother, but even without being Michael's mother, an incredible woman with her, her support. Cavalon, who I know personally, Chris, for many years now, and his support, whether or not he is slinging gift subs around. In this crazy topsy-turvy world we're in right now, just showing up means so much passing the link to the next person, bringing another friend to the table to hang out with us. Princess Shiara, I think you have been here for every episode so far, and we're up to episode five, which, by the way, I did not put. Let me just put that right here and just change that real quick. I should have done that before. Oopsie. Hi, Sammy. <laughs> there you go. 
Um, we appreciate and love each and every one of you. Now, if you do have Amazon Prime subscribing on Twitch for free to you, but it supports the channel by using Twitch Prime, incredible, awesome. But always happy to have you here, no matter what, just because you showed up. You ask questions, you interact with us, and, and that's why we do the show. <laughs> if it was just for us, we don't need to broadcast it. It's because we're hoping somebody out there gets something out of it. And you guys are uh, really the driving reason that we do it every week. So, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Now, we're going to give the others just a moment to get back. I'm going to check and see who's lurking. Not because I'm calling you out, just because I like to know. Oh, I see a couple of familiar names. Glad to see you guys. Thank you for hanging out in the background. Um, appreciate that. We're about to go into the second hour where we're going to discuss initiate hazing. Or initiate hazing, again, depending how you want to That's pronounce right, it. Bitch. That's right, bitch. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm just going to let everybody settle back into their chairs, and then we're going to get back into it. Tara's the last to join us, putting her headset back on, so welcome back. We're going to do the quick round robin of introductions for anybody that came in late I am Travis Sivart. I am the author of the upcoming Silver and Smith, as well as Harbinger, book one of the Downfall series, which is my epic medieval fantasy. Now, let's go in reverse order and start with Tempe, please. I am Tempe Wade. I am the author of the Timely Revolution book series, um, and apparently an author of fantasy and romance, narrow as well. <laughs> Beautiful. As delightful as your personality and your face. Now, just <laughs> above... Aw, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Michael, your face is beautiful, hey, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. My name is Michael Thompson, author of fantasy and superhero books. I'm going to show my first novel, Absolutely. World of the Orbs of Love, since I'm wearing the shirt today. World of the Orb, two best pals stumble across the hidden world that the Museum of Natural History was desperately trying to keep secret, and they're sent on a harrowing treasure hunt to find Earth again. Tara. Hi, my name is Tara Moeller, and I'm the uh, Dreamer in Chief at DreamPunkPress.com. Title. And <laughs> um, and I want to talk about our latest book that came out on April 1st. Yeah, April Fool's Day, but um, there are ten signed by the author copies uh, waiting for the first ten folks who purchased um, it from. DreamPuntPress.com. So, fifteen ninety nine. Um, it's a good read. Who's the author? YA. Uh, Zara John. Thank you. So, and then Aaron. Hi, uh, I'm Aaron Kennedy. Uh, I'm author of uh, the Ships of Valor series, uh, starting with Persona Non Grata. I've been a technical writer for about twenty five years. I've been published in the Army Times and the uh, the NCO Journal. Uh, uh, in addition to all the writing that I do for my PhD and stuff. Um, that's me. Okay. Now, in the second hour, it's our technical hour. We want to discuss initiate hazing. So I'll, I'll open up this thought, and if uh, any of you guys need to interrupt me with your own thoughts, just uh, throw a hand up so I can see, and I'll pass it to you. In the writing community... From other writers, largely it's been a very neutral response, which I understand because what you do in any creative thing, a lot of people are like, I'm going to be whatever the creative title is, writer, artist, uh, face painter, whatever. And you see a lot of people say that who never actually do it. Or they do one thing and they make no further effort. And you go, cool, good job. But it's hard to invest in that. Now, the other side of that, now I did have the extremes of people who helped me immensely. Which, fun fact, when I go back to them and go, thank you so much for everything you did, they're like, what? I don't know what I did. You, you're welcome, but... Yeah. <laughs> then the other side of that spectrum are people who are just nasty to new people to the craft. Which I have never really experienced that. But I hear some other people have. And that's what we want to discuss. Um, there is a certain amount of 
hazing everybody will go through because there's a learning curve and there's times where even in kindness you haze hey here's something i've learned that you're not seeing yet trust me you're going to need this and maybe that new person whether it was me at that point or or anybody else i've spoken to goes great i heard you i got it other times we have to learn by screwing it up all by ourselves so anybody else got some thoughts on the intro part of this well yeah and and travis travis was a huge huge help to me uh, i wouldn't have gotten where i went got without travis and uh i i thank you for that because when i when i wrote this i had no clue what to do i had no idea what to do. i had no idea you could put these things out yourself it was just something you know i had i had no clue about the process so uh i knew travis from conventions i called him up and said hey can i buy you lunch and pick your brain <laughs> i got lunch at a chinese place guys it's pretty it's a great deal <laughs> Oh, Which, to be I fair, is him. more than book sales for a lot of times. <laughs> it's, it's fair. I bribed him with cigars, too. <laughs> yeah, that's I bribed true. him with cigars, too. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and he, he walked me through the process. And with his help, I got where I needed, needed to be. And I've tried very hard to do the same thing for other people. I've had three or four people come to me since I published and said, hey, would you mind helping me out, giving me some advice? And every time I have sat down with them, whether it's been at lunch or if it's on the phone or, you know, What's back and forth through email. What's the first piece of advice? The first piece of advice was the one you gave me, get an editor. <laughs> no, it's write the book. Write the book, write yeah. the book. Don't, yes. don't come at me with two people... chapters, write a book. Yeah, most of the ones that have come to me had already written. Beautiful. Um, I had one person that come to, came to me that had hooked up with a vanity publisher ah. that was trying to ah. rake her out of money. And yeah. I'm like, no, no. And she was an older lady. Um, it's actually one of my mother's friends. And I, um, I said, no, no, stop, 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 stop. Let me help you. And uh, we, I, we got her up and running in just a, like a month. Got her away from the vanity publisher. Got her up and running. Um and I try to be very helpful and to do what Travis did for me and just kind of pass it down the line. And I've said all along, someone helped me and I will continue to help someone else. I'll pass it, you know, I'll kick the can down the road. But other people sometimes, you know, I've been at tables at conventions and you strike up a conversation with another writer and you mention that you're a writer and it's like, whoop. Sorry, I don't have time to speak to you. <laughs> and like, by the way, not that okay. Tempe was about to, we're not going to mention names, guys, because we've all had experiences no, no, no. with that person. And I'm not talking about a specific person either, but we have had writers that will not speak to other writers. And I guess that's the worst that I've had to deal with is they're just like. <laughs> um, so go on, Tempe. Yeah, and, you know, I do, it's not something that I understand because – you know, people read more than one book. People who read, read tons of books, and they're always on the lookout for something new. And, you know, I recommend to people all the time different writers. And, you know, it's it's about, it's a community. And the more you help people, the more you help the community. And it's a community so, of introverts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. a rare thing. <laughs> If you catch one of the elusive writers out, you really should talk to them. <laughs> but approach them slowly, gently, With hands in plain view. <laughs> like a cat. That's you can't right. sneak like up cat. on it and just pet it. Like a rabid cat. You're not sure what kind of reaction you're going to get the closer you get. <laughs> but, but, yeah, it's a community, and it's something that we should be building, especially as indie writers, um, because it's something that we should be building, we should be growing together instead of working against each other. I have a quick comment on that. Oh, Princess says, you are so helpful, Tempe. You've definitely been my guide and sensei. And that's oh, a beautiful I'm glad thing. I could help you. <laughs> um, finding that one person or that core group, it, it's a beautiful thing. And I, I had a couple, a handful of them also, who some of them I wrote books with, some I had a guest on Talk of the Tavern. Um. Oh, darn it, Tempe. There was something I was going to comment on that you just said. Um, Indie I d- community pulling together. 
Uh, yeah, it might have been the indie community thing. I don't recall. I'm sure it'll come back to me, and I'll interrupt the next person talking. You guys got some <laughs> thoughts on this? Who were your guys' mentors or influences? Not like, I read Stephen King, but Bob told me. Aaron? Oh, okay. Oh, well, um, guy that I worked with, uh, he ended up being kind of a, not an alpha or a beta reader, but somebody that after I had already got the book done, uh, a guy named Jeff uh, Jeffrey Berger. He actually uh, ended up doing the cover for me. Um, he's the author of the Wings of Steel series, uh, and he's fairly high ranked when it comes to the sci-fi stuff. He's got five or six books out now, uh, but he went through and he's like, oh, hey, okay. I met him through a friend of a friend, so when he read it, I wasn't approaching him, asking him for anything. It was a case of somebody else handed him and said, hey, check this guy out. He's a friend of mine. Tell me what you think. Um, and I think that's where we're kind of running into maybe a little bit of that uh, neutrality or pushback is you get the bigger artists and they're constantly being asked for things. Hey, can you take a look at this? And as Travis says, hand me a book and sure. Uh, and I'll put this out here right now. I've got my own publishing house. Tara's, uh, Tara's got hers. Travis got hers. Anybody that comes to me with a completed book that has gone through an editing process and has actually got a cover, I'll publish you under my house. I don't care. I'll support you as best as, you get, as best I'm able because I want to be the kind of guy that supports things. And I think I've told that to Travis before. I'd rather be the kind of the guy who goes, yes, and than no but. Um, and that's just a standing offer to anybody in the community. But you got to do the first thing of, Write it and get it edited because um, we're putting out product here. Um, the, but on the flip side of that, it, we're doing all this stuff and it's hard to approach people and ask these questions and then actually take the advice because we get out of artistic mode into, oh, it's a business mode. And I know I sound like a broken record when I say that, but on the technical side of the house, we're a business. We are a self-employed uh, or employer in Tara's case, um, business, and we're trying to build it bigger, better, and produce good product. Now, Tara, I see you rocking back and forth. Usually that means you've got something percolating. <laughs> no, that's just my autism coming out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Do, you, do you have any thoughts on this before I pop over to Michael and then put mine in? Um. You had said, you know, who, who do we get advice from? Um, and, of course, Travis, I get advice from you. Um, don't always take it. Um, but that usually bites me in the butt. And um, or, and sometimes it's, it's just a different artistic viewpoint. Um, but others, and, and like you said, there's those that share. John Hartness, um, Paul Sass Books. Um, went down to his um, conference in March, um, and he's he's one of these guys. He will just tell you every, anything that you ask. He will answer the question as best you can. Um, but don't argue with him because he's telling you what he's done to be successful. And so, you know, if you're asking him for advice, don't knock him on it. You know what I mean? I mean, I I, I was there and somebody started you know, questioning, and he was just like, which one of us is the expert here? You know, you ask me for advice. Um, something that I do run into sometimes, and I try to always give advice and say, well, here's the mistakes I made, okay? Uh, don't buy 100 books of the, you know, 100 copies of your first book if you're self-published and think you're going to sell them all in a weekend. No. Um, so, you know, but so when you couch it like that, hey, this was my mistake, I mean, you know, don't make this mistake, you know, this can be iffy, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get the, the pushback. Um, it, it can be hard. The next person that comes up and asks those questions for you to answer them. And I think, you know, as Aaron said, you know, the, the folks who've been doing this for a while, after after a bit, they, they get that enough that they're like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, but we were all beginners at one point. And if we remember that, um, I think it can go a long way even after we get successful. Does anybody here no longer feel like a beginner? Because I still feel like a beginner most of the time. Oh, heck yes. <laughs> I'm still a beginner. 
I, I question everything I do still. I mean, it's I, I'm always learning. I learn something new every day, and I don't. When I offer advice, I don't claim to be an expert. I'm just offering my experience, and if what helped me helped you, great. But you know, I did what worked for me, and ultimately, you're going to have to figure out what works for you because there's no magic bullet. Yeah, yeah. everyone has like a strong point and areas where they need to grow and learn. Now, Michael, I want you to finish what we're going around, but first, I want to read a comment here. Just ask if we feel like a beginner. This comment says it all. Cold Brew Signs, you're the one lurking. Glad to see you chiming in. Says, I don't often talk a lot, and I'm very much a quiet observer, but I did want to say I appreciate being here and being able to benefit from everyone's experience and wisdom as I try to figure out my own direction. And there's the answer. Yes, we still have moments where we question. I think that's a value, by the way. It's when you're of absolute confidence thinking you can't do wrong is when you've lost a lot of opportunity. So, George Lucas, episode one. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> Michael, let's move over to you real quick now. <laughs> Changing the subject. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I, I do want to say that um, uh, the first convention I had ever done, I had done book signing since I was 13, but I hadn't gotten into the convention scene until after I graduated college. And the first convention I had ever done, I was in the corner of uh, Author Alley in RavenCon, and that's where I met Travis and Tara. That was your first convention? And, uh, that was my first convention okay. ever. And you guys have been so welcoming, and I so value you guys as um, as friends. And and it's nice because uh, writing is uh, an isolating career, and it's you know being in this community is a lot like having coworkers and people you can ask advice from. So, um, but you guys know that I. Definitely, I'm I'm like super vocal about my books when I when I sell them, so um, I I talk to literally everyone who enters my zone. So therefore, I've encountered like almost every possible type of reaction um, that someone can have to what I do or what I'm trying to introduce to them. <laughs> it's and, true, Mike. Michael tossed strings to bookmarks and throw them out and reel people in <laughs> yeah my bookmarks it, it's it's a lot it's a lot like fishing <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly uh, what it is yeah but i i i always like i hang on to the positive stuff a lot more than the negative stuff um the negative stuff usually makes hilarious stories later on but uh the the positive stuff is what i hang on to and especially in the moment when i'm when i'm selling and when I'm trying to like reach reach new people, uh, I will I will like immediately forget if something if something like shattering just just happened. I had had my friends who had uh, never seen me do my thing before. Like they, they know that I'm an author, but um, early on, like uh, when World of the Orb came out, is when is when people started coming to my events because I started doing cooler events like cons and stuff that people wanted to come to more. And uh, I remember my buddy, uh, my old roommate, he sat behind my table uh, with me. And then uh, I was I was like, hey, you want a free book? Want a free book? And people were like, no, no. And then there were a few rude people. It's, 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 it's like, oh, no. And I, I even had one guy like, like take the bookmark, rip it, and then, and then laugh. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah, but I curled my mustache while I did it. <laughs> I was just like, I was like, oh. All right, and then I just moved on to the next person, and my friend was like, it's like, oh my god, and I was like, what? He said, he said, he said, how do you subject yourself to this? This is horrible. Like, you're putting your, you're putting your soul on the line. <laughs> That's your child. That this is your livelihood. This is, this is the worst feeling. Ever. I was, I, I was like, ah. <laughs> it's like, doesn't matter. You just got, you gotta keep moving. No. But man, if I may. Yeah. Um, commenting on a few things. By the way. Two of the people that very much helped me in the beginning. Um, Tanya Brown, who wrote the Railroad series. Very good book. Even the audio book is well done. Enjoyed the hell out of reading it. She also wrote, uh, hold on, it sounds like Armageddon. Nomergeddon. 
basically an apocalypse by gnomes. It's great, uh-huh. fun, nice. clever, witty, medieval fantasy, a little filthy. Loved it. Um, and Wendy Callahan, who actually co-wrote Steampunk for Simpletons with me right there. These were two people that definitely helped me in my initial baby steps without expecting anything back and delighted to do so. Um, here's something I'm going to tell anybody who is new and you're approaching somebody. Don't come at an author going, can you read my stuff when you don't have a completed book, as Aaron mentioned, and you've never read a single sentence they wrote. For two reasons. First of all, they might be a crap writer. Um, and you don't <laughs> want their advice. Uh, second of all, have a little courtesy. And I'm not saying you got to go buy every one of their books. I'm just saying be familiar with their work so you can speak to them about their work. It's a relationship, people. It's a give and take. You can't come at somebody going, gimme, 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 and they're like, you know, I've got a job I'm doing, right? How about you help me, I'll help you? Then it's a relationship. It's a friendship. But right now you're just coming at me like a dog that wants to eat the sandwich in my hand and I don't know you. Um, and as Tara just mentioned, know how to take advice. If you ask advice and somebody gives you advice, even if you think that advice is complete crap, shut your mouth and take it. You went to them and asked them for a reason for you to justify your point of view or to uh, defend why you did something. Swallow that for a moment. You asked for this feedback and advice. Now, maybe they're wrong, but at least give it the consideration that maybe they know what they're talking about. You respected it enough to go to them. Value your own opinion in that. Trust yourself. You went to them for a reason. Listen to them. Now, once you mull it over for a day, three days, a week, then throw it out the door if you want to. Absolutely. But at least... Give the person the value that made you go to them in the first place. Learn how to take advice, in other words. So, Tempe, I'm really curious. You've mentioned you've you've taken some blowback. You've taken some crap. More of a snubbing than direct, because writers are... Yeah, and I mean, I've met writers who, who think that... Uh, okay, let me, let me say this up front. Mm-hmm. I will never run down another author's work, Mm -hmm. whether I like it or not, because to me, writing is a form of art, and beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Right. I might think that their stuff is crap, (laughs) but I will never say that, because it's it's very, writing is personal. Um, I know my writing, my characters, they're like my family. And I'm very protective, which is why I made the remark, you know, if I ever, for some reason, this blew up and got made into a, a, a TV series or something, that I would need to pick the characters because I'm the one, they're my babies. You know, they're, I, they're in my mind. Um, but there are people out here that just because you've been writing for a long time doesn't mean you know everything. And... Writing a chapter in 15 years does not make you a writer, just FYI. <laughs> I've had people say, I'm a writer. I've written a chapter in, in the past 15 years. And I'm like, well, that's great. Are you going to finish? <laughs> well, let me, let me help you with that perspective. They are a writer. They wrote. Okay. That is the definition okay. of a writer. They're yes. not an author. That's a good point, yes. Um, and yes. this is something in the beginning I went, oh, am I, am I? You know, I've only done some short stories. And by the way, I have seen people headline a convention with one short story published in somebody else's book. And I'm like, how do I not value my own opinion and my own experience when this is what can headline a whole convention? Um, sure. So value your own stuff. But yeah, you don't want to cut anybody down, and Tempe, here's what I'll tell you. You might say you'll never put anybody down. Yeah, you wait till you pick up a book that hasn't been edited well. You will say some shit. You'll be smart and say it privately and not drag them down publicly. Absolutely. 
I might say it in my mind, but I won't say it to or, the writer. <laughs> no, no, or to close people. And if you like the writer, yeah. for example, if you catch one of us doing this, oh, my God, please come to us and tell us. Yeah. You know, and maybe yeah. your opinion is is maybe we consider it and go, well, I don't think she's right. But we definitely want that kindness. I, I, and, I mean, I've had writers come to me and say, hey, can you write a review for me? <laughs> and I've... I've read it, and it wasn't particularly my thing, but, and here's the other thing, I, when I, when I wrote the review for this person, I picked out the best possible elements, and I gave them a five-star rating, because, again, that is their art, it's not my place to judge, you know their art, and I—that's not something I will ever publicly do to anyone. So I don't feel like reviews were invented to give people a reason to not go to a place or an item or an art, because I'm already not at that restaurant or that theme park or that book or that movie. I'm already not there. I don't need something else to make me not go there. Right. I need to know what the pluses are. Why should I go there? And I feel like that's what reviews are for. Yeah. You know, and also from the business aspect, to beat Aaron's drum here for a moment, it's the thumper rule. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. You are in a business world, and that person might be a crap writer, but they could also be running the next publishing house or be the next chief and editor of you don't know. Or they could just be that little sniping asshole that goes online and undermines every damn thing you do because they have no life. Whichever it is, if you can't say something nice, shut your mouth. Walk and, away. and that's the rule I try to go. I can find the good in everything. And, it yeah. might not be much, but I will find it. And, you know, I will, you know, I yeah. will pull the good out of everything. Um but when you and it's it's hard because that's the rule I go by when you meet other writers who don't live by that rule and you have to kind of stop and take a breath and say okay that's the way they live that's not the way you live right that's not the way you want to be so don't be that way and that's that's my approach with all of this um, so that that's just that's just me. <laughs> No. And I'll tell you, you said you talking about feeling like a, you know, write the difference between writers and authors. I still don't consider myself a writer most days. You know, I've got four published books out and several more written, and some days I still don't consider myself a writer. Or I still writer. question it. You're a machine. I'm a machine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just spouting off crap that's in my head, and people <laughs> happen to like it. <laughs> One of uh, Tara, Aaron, Michael, do you guys have anything to add to this? And I have to quickly just turn on the light here. I'll be right back. Keep talking. All right. Uh, this goes back to my point about being the kind of person that supports. Tempe is 100% the kind of person that supports in this regard. She, she wants to find the good in things and highlights that. Um, everything that I've dealt with in regards to Michael um, shows the same thing. Now, Tara from the editor, uh, Tara from the editor standpoint... She's still doing it, but she's looking at it with a critical eye, um, which if she's offering advice, it's because of her expertise on there. Uh, just like if we give it to a beta reader and have them read it and they hi- and they just point something out, it's not because they're being mean or anything like that. It's because they see something that we have a blind spot to, yeah. and it goes back to the, uh, the two people agree rule and one of them could be me. If I look at it and go, oh, wow, all right, this maybe needs to change, or eh. But if you start seeing a pattern, we start to look in that and go, okay. And that's where it comes into the, the taking of advice. Yeah. Um, especially as we talk to other people, go, hey, what do you think about this? Um, and we highlight and go, okay, well, this is what I saw. It's not that I'm being mean or anything. It's just what I'm seeing here, and there's um, an issue. It may not be a problem, but it may just be an issue. And there's a difference between being giving honest feedback that's helpful and being mean and snarky and just trying to run somebody else down because they happen to write as well and you think oh there's not room for two writers in this you know in this hall and that's not the 
the place at all. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've encountered people like that, and there's definitely like you go and in, walk into a bookstore. There's plenty of room on the shelf, you know. Exactly. For everyone, support the art. Well, we know negative people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What is it? One out of every five or one out of every ten is just a negative person, and they're always talking about what they don't like, not what they do like, and. I understand if you're getting hammered a lot, it's going to come out. But some of that is you're the common factor here. If if you're having a bad day 365 days out of the year, maybe it's not your environment. Maybe it's you. Yes, exactly. Here's something else. And, and, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, if you put your work out there, you have to learn to develop a thick skin and yeah. let the stuff just kind of roll. Because if, if you take stuff to heart too much, it will eat you alive inside. You just got to let it roll. Let it roll. If you run across somebody like that, say, nice to meet you. Have a great day. Move along and, and just let it go. Here's something else I'll tell you. If all your beta readers or even just one of your beta readers, if any of your beta readers are only giving you positive feedback, they're not a good beta reader. They might be a fan. They might be a great friend. They're not a good beta reader. You should get everybody that can find something in your work and go, hey, take a look at this. And by the way, John here says, I run into professionals in the industry who tell folks that their work is good just to get them to move on. And then they don't advance because they think that they're, what they're doing is good. Princess Shiera says, yes, indeed, there is a whole community. It shouldn't feel like the story from Dr. Seuss, the sneech, uh, this, the sneeches. It shouldn't be a seclusion or ridicule of others that degrade certain writers for a minor problem. So criticism is of utmost importance. It's how we improve. It's how we find the flaws. But keep in mind with that criticism, there should also be that positive reinforcement of I love your description ability, but your characters don't come off as unique or whatever it is. Um, you know, you can strengthen this, or it might be, man, you use the word okay a lot. Whatever it is, they should be able to find good and bad in your writing. And as Aaron said, use the two-person rule. You hear this from multiple beta readers, and if you have... 25 beta readers, if you hear it from five or six, maybe listen. If you have two beta readers, if you hear it from both of them, maybe listen. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, pay attention to your editor. Your editor is not your enemy. Your editor is your friend. They are trying to help you create the best work you can make. If anything, I look at Tara when she edits my work, and matter of fact, I called her the other day, earlier this week, and went, do you have anything else? She's like, no, no, just that. I'm like, what about this? And she's like, hmm. Yeah, you know, and, and we discussed that one point that's one of my beta readers pointed out in a different book that they read. And she's like, you know, you could work on that. I'm like, awesome. So I took this criticism that I kind of went, that might be something to it. Let me get a new opinion and went to my editor because Tara tries not to change our voice when she edits our books. But she Tara also is very good. I'm sorry. Tara is very good about that. Um you know, she very much doesn't want to change your story, but she'll make a note, hey, maybe this would be a better place for this, or maybe this will be, and I appreciate that, because I didn't want somebody that went in and just changed everything right. topsy-turvy and took it, everything away from but she what will I tear was it trying up, to won't do. She? <laughs> it's, and I don't I, know what you're talking about, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate that. I want that. If I send it, I, I have had more than one other editor go, I love your story so much I get caught up and I forget to edit. And I'm like, God, that's awesome. Till you get the return product and people are finding error after error after error. Then you're like, you know what? You need to edit. <laughs> Stop enjoying it. <laughs> Thank you. But, mm. um, mm -hmm. So, let's that's talk. I tried to read the book twice when I edit. Um, I edit both times. I mean, one's not just a read through. Um, but I try to read through, tw you know, the first time it's definitely all of the stuff that really hits me. And then I'll go ahead and you guys don't see this because they're gone by the time you get it, but there'll be big highlights in, in a couple of different colors 
um, for that second go through. I might not read every word the second time, but I go to those highlights because it's like, okay, something here, either you need something to follow it up because it's, it's a little different and I want to make sure that you're doing that or it doesn't make sense for the story so far and I need to, you know, and I'll like, oh, wait, yeah, here it is. I'll go back. I'll unhighlight that because you wrapped it around and whatnot. So um, you guys don't see that process. You just see the red lines that I give you of my suggestions. And I always couch that as a suggestion because as a writer, I recognize that it's not my book. Um, you've asked me to help you with some specific, um, you know, the verbiage, a little bit of development, whatever. Um, but because I am also a writer, I understand that it's not my baby. Um, and I try very, very hard not to, to change anything. Um, but yeah, there'll be big highlighted um, passages for me to go back to and reread after you know I've gotten through the first time just to make sure, uh, you know, whether it's something that I want to make sure you followed up on or something I'm like, okay, I can't fix if this If I may right interrupt now. real quick. Mm -hmm. Evan, thank you for that host. Good to see you. Thank you for popping in. And when you're done, Tara, I have a few comments to read here. Mm -hmm. Carry on. Um, that completely lost my train of thought thought because I also have a cat behind me banging on the door. My apologies. So go ahead, Travis. Real quick, let me read <laughs> Princess Shiara's comment. She says, I feel like criticism is a teeter-totter. The weight fluctuates and it depends on us to see how we'll balance it, to keep it neutral and calm as opposed to a sensitivity. I too still struggle with making sure I don't take it to heart too much. Uh, Princess, I don't know if you were here. I think you were. I don't even know if I said it on air. But the first time Tara took this book right here, I went, uh, can I re-edit the first couple pages for you? And she did a dozen or more, way more than I expected. And it was like, my 10th grade with just red lines all over it which by the way Tara let me say this the first thing I do anytime you hand me back an edit is go read every comment I love comments in the margins I love them um, right now all the ones in this book you just returned it's like mm, is that the word you wanted there's like no good juicy comments good or bad so all I'm telling you is you, I don't expect them but please feel free to put them if you're inclined. I love that personal one-on-one -on -one feedback. And I almost want to create like a, a message group to go through each one and discuss <laughs> it with you and everything. Because I, I, good or bad, I love them. Um, but Shiara, what I'm telling you is, uh, yeah, when I first got those edits back from Tara, after I had paid to have it edited and I got it back, it hurt my feelings. And I got upset. And I read through them all. And I closed the document, and I went to bed. I shut down my computer, and I went to bed. And the next day, I went back, opened it back up after a good meal to make sure my mood was leveled, um, and read them again, this time a little more self-critically. And I was so glad she was bold enough to do this, and I sent her a message via Facebook, I believe, at the time, going, you hurt my feelings. Thank you. Because these are the, and she's like, oh, thank God, I have lost friends by doing this, and I was worried about upsetting you. I'm like, oh, you did, but in a good way. And I've gone back to her again and again. I recommended her to Tempe and other people because my feelings got hurt in the good way. Aaron? Uh, speaking to this, because I spoke to Travis probably the week after it happens, uh, and he's like, it there was a sense of euphoria about him because he actually got back good edits. Yeah, they hurt, but he he was actually excited about it because it showed him what was going on. Because I was one of his, not necessarily a beta reader, but a, after first publication. Um, but it kind of reminded me of uh, Pendulette. He's got a couple things out there that are great, and I think they'll work well for us. Uh, whenever him and Teller are doing uh, magic tricks, the first phase that they're always doing is they just tear the trick apart. They look for any possible way that this will not work because they want it to fail immediately rather than having all that investment in it. Uh, so if trick's not going to work, why dedicate man hours when they've got just them? Where as the 100-person crew that runs the show, that's a lot of investment in it. Um, the other thing 
is he tells a story about him uh, and Siegfried and Roy. Pendulette is outspoken. He can be a bit of a dick when it comes to his public appearances and stuff like that. Uh, case in point, his face got eaten by a friggin' tiger. <laughs> he has said that publicly numerous times. However, every time Siegfried and Roy heard their name mentioned by Pendulette, they sent a thank you note saying thank you for your kind words in public. Because all it is is publicity for them. Feedback is publicity. Uh, so there's no need to... I don't want to contradict you, uh, Shara, but what we're looking at is I'd rather you be talking about me than not talking about me, even if it's a little bit bad, uh, because that's one more person that has heard of me then. That's that great uh, Pirates of the Caribbean meme. Mm. What's remember that? that? Oh, it's the... You're the worst pirate I've ever heard of. Yeah, but you have heard of me. <laughs> you have heard of me. I watched a stream last night where after the guy did his writing, um, he watched an anime. And it was, like, on Rotten Tomatoes or IMDb, really low-rated anime. Like, really <laughs> bad. It was, like, 20 minutes long. And, uh... Basically, you know, they kind of, like, rolled their eyes at it and laughed about it, and I'm like, but you watched it. Yeah, that's true. You watched it, and you're going to tell somebody else about it. You know, so, Michael, you've been kind of sitting back and letting everybody else talk. Do you have some thoughts? I want to give you the floor if you want it. Oh, it's okay. I, I've just been, I've, I've been really tired lately, but, um, so I'm, I'm, in, I'm enjoying absorbing more today. Um... But I, I guess I, I, I'll give a shout out um, to, I'm going to go way, way back, way back when, many years ago. I want to give a shout out to my fourth grade teacher, Mr. Arisich. And uh, he's the reason I became an author, uh, for real. Um, and, and you guys know the story that j just the year before I was getting my artwork ripped up by my other teacher. Do you guys um, want to hear the full story? Go listen to the previous broadcast. It's mm -hmm. in there, and it's a wonderful story. Go on, Michael. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but he, uh, when I ended up in his class and, and he had that creative element and um, all the things I was, that that was happening naturally, that, that I was doing, you know, no matter what, uh, was suddenly like, uh, it, was, it was like, hey, this is great. And uh, you, you should do it. You should do it more and you should uh, try this. Um, so that, that, that was incredible. So shout out to all the teachers out there. I want to comment on something else that was set up here. <clears throat> John said it. If you get somebody in your face that you just give them false praise to make them go away, you're a dick. Okay? You can give the praise of you're working on it. That is great. That is awesome. But you have things to learn. Don't give especially somebody just starting out, you don't want to make them feel like they're at the professional level day one before they've ever published. You want to encourage them, but you mm -hmm. also need to prepare them for that criticism that is going to help them hone their skill set and build their skill set. Otherwise, you're giving them a participation ribbon of life. And this does not... I see Aaron when you, raising your hand. I'll pass it. When you got a chance. When you got a chance. It's, I'm, I'm pretty much done. I'll, I'll finish the thought up with uh, giving everybody a participation ribbon does not create a better future, a better product, a, a stronger art. And it's a cop-out, which I understand wanting to get people out of your face when you're busy with something, but there's a better way to do it. Aaron? Uh, this actually goes into some uh, friggin' the health and the leadership, which is actually my bailiwick on the physical fitness side. If you tell somebody, hey, I'm planning on losing 30 pounds this year, and they go, oh, wow, good for you. You're going to get an endorphin high off that, uh, which in turn prevents you from actually losing the 30 pounds. <laughs> oh. uh, I'm not joking. The same happens when you talk about writing. When you say what your plan is to another person and you get positive feedback to that, it – kills momentum because you get the high immediately uh, that you would have got when you said, I have completed this. I have accomplished this. So you want to be, a, you don't necessarily want to share what you're doing or how far you've gone, or you want to couch it and go, Hey, I finished three chapters in this. Oh, rock on. Or rather than I'm writing a book. 
um, or I'm doing this, couch it in what you've accomplished as opposed to what you are working towards. No. Because uh, it can just still kill that mental feedback that we've built in. Flip it the other way. When somebody comes at you going, I'm writing a book, and how you give them encouragement at that point in time, hey, that's great. What's the next step? How much are you doing? Make them accountable for what they're doing. This gives them that encouragement, but it also makes them know you're not done. You have work to do, which I hate it when I get a book back from Tara and I have more work to do because I already wrote it, damn it. <laughs> but you I wrote do. it twice. <laughs> well, and also Elizabeth Pickle Lady, who is on Monday Night's Talk of the Tavern with me most times, um, and is a screenwriter, she beta read Portals and sent back really helpful stuff. And I went, <sighs> not because of the criticism, but because she's right, and now I have to go back and do more work when I want to go to the next thing. Yeah, um, and, and But it was some really good advice and really good points that she made, and uh, we want to do this to each other and anybody else coming. I have a lot of people. Good night, John. Drive safe. We'll see you again soon. Tomorrow night to the game. Um, I have people pop in to the chat or when I'm at a convention and they're like, I'm a writer. I'm like, great. What have you written? And maybe it's one chapter. Maybe it's whatever. I'm like, have you finished it? They're like, no. And I'm like, great. When are you going to finish it? And you see them get this deer in the headlight look like, uh, uh, and I'm like, this, this is, this is it. You know, when are you going to finish it? This is what you're trying to do. You want to be this. You've got to do this. Um, and this is something, like I said, when I asked Tempe, when we first started this topic at the top of the hour, what was the first advice? And she said, get an editor. It's actually the second advice. First is write the damn book. Yeah. Uh, she, she skipped over that because she doesn't have that problem. Right. <laughs> Where, uh, You're right. Where are you like myself, by then? <laughs> yeah. Whereas people like myself have been freaking plugging away at the same book for months, if not years. Um, now, I'm writing other things, which is important, but you can't focus on what you are doing. Focus on what you've done and then work towards what you're doing. Right. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, each is valid. If somebody's like, well, I've been working on it for 15 years. No. If you wrote one chapter, if you wrote one word a day, <laughs> you already beat past one chapter. Um, you haven't been working on it is the point. You haven't. But if you have been working on it, and I don't care if that's 50 words a day or 5,000 words a day, if you're actually working on it on a regular basis, that's not... 50 words a month on a regular basis, preferably every day, but sometimes you can't. When I was working 70-plus hours out of the house a couple weeks ago, I, I, I'm not writing. I'm just not. You know, I'm out of my house 12 hours a day, six days a week, and I still have to do all the other normal stuff. So it didn't happen. Um, so I get life happens. But, yeah, if you're writing, write. If you're drawing, draw. If you're... A chef, cook. Whatever it is that you are passionate about, do it. Otherwise, you're not doing it. And this is what I'm telling people. I have people approach me at conventions or here, and they're like, read my stuff. And I'm like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> have you read my stuff? Can we trade here? Can you go? I'll give you a free completed novel. Go read it. Drop a review. I'll read your stuff. Yeah, Tempe. There's an, an, an analogy. When you go in a store to use the bathroom, you always buy something when you're in there. So that's a good analogy. You don't use the store's bathroom without buying something. If you're going to shit here, <laughs> buy something. <laughs> fair. Fair. <clears throat> but yeah, keep Our in books mind. books are really good. They're not toilets. <laughs> to get support. No, but they can be read in the toilet. <laughs> that's right. To get support from somebody, you have to shortage uh, uh, yeah. hey once you buy it you know? right. <laughs> that's why all my stuff's printed on soft paper in these hard times yes i'm sorry travis we just completely no no, no it's okay it's 
if you're going to approach somebody for help, expect to give something back, okay? You're not any more entitled than any one of us. And we are doing what we can to make a living with this within our capability and, and allowability. So if you're going to come to somebody and go, hey, give me something, your time, which for us, time is money. It takes time to write these books. You might read it in six hours or three days or two weeks, but it took us anywhere from weeks to months to years to write it. And that's a lot of time and effort. So for you to go, tell me how to do it right. And then when we do, for you to come back going, well, that's not right. Well, to that point, what a lot of people don't understand is that this business, it's not a climb up a mountain. It's a maze and a dungeon. Mm -hmm. It's not one of those, hey, we're, we run into things that should not work the way they do work. Uh, if, uh, you said you had submitted an uh, inquiry. That's a gatekeeper that we got to run into. That's a, that's a mob boss that if you don't hey, uh, do the good. script correctly, you just don't make it past them. You can't get to the next step. You can have a great product that is ready to publish by one of the big five, but you can't call them directly. You have to go through an agent that's already got built up relationships, and they have to be looking for something like what you got based on, oh, you know what? This month it's mermaids. Next month it's centaurs. Um, oh, we're doing time travel this week. <laughs> and just hope it hits at the right time. Um, I like that metaphor, Aaron. That's, that's good. <laughs> that's yeah. good. Did you make that up or read it somewhere? No, I made that one up. Well done. Thank you, if you ever want to be entertained, go on Twitter and look at agents and what their their query what their query list is. Oh, God. Circus clowns uh, jumping through alien saucers that are doing cartwheels off of mermaids. It's the craziest thing Carl I've ever seen. <laughs> Well, look at how many movies are coming out. Because you've got these like sets of movies that all come out around the same time. Like yes. between the Bugs Life and Ants, they both came out at the same time. Um, Mouse Hunt. Yeah, there's uh, a big uh, dystopian hit after the Hunger Games, and you had like Maze Runner and all that stuff. You know, with the agent that I, sorry, cat fell off something while sleeping. Um, He's okay, Otter. With the agent I queried today, this is an agency that another writer friend, R.S. Belcher, Rod Belcher, great guy, good books. Um, he's with this agency, and they tied him to Tor Books. Nice. Um, and not saying that'll happen for me, but I went and looked at their website and looked at their different agents and their wish lists, and I've been looking at those wish lists for about three months. And they have been pretty steady and solid. I've seen some changes, but in general, it hasn't flipped week to week, which is a beautiful thing. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for posting his thing there. Yeah, you're um, welcome, sir. And that, this is a whole other topic, but we will talk about publishing houses at some point in time. And we'll talk about stuff like what Tara and I have, which is a publishing group, not a publishing house. So it's a cooperative. It's a commune of writers supporting each other. And then you I've have, been told that's the better word, collective. Collective. But I, yeah. Cooperative, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a, Syndicate. <laughs> mob. Um, so, and then there's the... Oh, no, no, family. Mafia. You have, the, <laughs> you have the big five, you have the mid, and then you have us. So, and we'll discuss that down the road because, yeah, a lot of times there is... Different challenges and different discrepancies, depending which one you're dealing with. And mm -hmm. there are pros and cons to each of them. And I'll tell you what, I think there is more pros in the top five and doing it yourself than any of that middle ground. And by right. the way, Eben says, my dad said, to hell with publishers and created his own publishing company. And that's what Tara did with Dream Punk Press. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did would talk of the tavern publishing and apparently Aaron also what's the name of your oh and Michael too Michael Thompson name your uh, publisher. Bauer books Thompson Set. original productions there we go and Tempe Tempe W Wade I'm my own thing okay <laughs> so and when indie writing first started growing and by the way this is another reason to take criticism and listen as indie writers we want 
across the board, there was a stigma associated with indie writers for a long time. Oh, yeah. Because we were putting out crap. Yeah. And we but, want to bring new people in independently, not under us, and make sure we're putting out a good product because we... It's like Lindsey Sterling in the music industry. If you don't know who she is, look up Lindsey Sterling. She came out and she went to record companies and went, this is what I do, and they all went, the fuck? <laughs> um, and she went, cool. And she worked her ass off. Great choreography, great music, and just picked the scenes, got one person with a camera following her around, and then she'd studio record, match it up, do her own editing, and when she has a million followers on YouTube, record companies are like, um, 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 hello, can we? And she's like, no, no, I'm good. <laughs> I did all the work. Screw you, because that's yeah. what you told me. Um, always remember Sturgeon's Law, says Evan, when you're talking about putting out crap. What is Sturgeon's Law? And this will be a, then I want to give a quick go around to everybody's closing thoughts on, and maybe... In our closing thoughts, if you don't have anything in particular, name a way that we can support new people instead of alienate them. While we're waiting for Eben to type that, Tempe? Um, just, you know, if you if you see a new writer you, and somebody who's got a lot of questions, take, take one under your wing. Make it your good deed for the day or the week or the month or the year or whatever and sit down with them and help them out and that knowledge that you pass along, tell them, hey, pay it forward. Let them pay it forward to somebody else. And if we get, you know, everybody working together, we'll build a better collective product. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll – indie writers are not getting the recognition they should get at this point. And it's because of agents that are blocking us – they will block you because they don't like a query letter or something you wrote in a query letter, and they wouldn't even write, read what you wrote. There are a lot of good writers out here, and there are a lot of good stories out here that are never making it past the front door, and that's a shame. It's a shame that there are so many stories that are not making it out here, and we need to do a better job as a collective group of making a better product and helping each other out with it. Tara? Um, bite your tongue a lot. Um, <laughs> a lot of, <laughs> um, especially if you go ahead and you take somebody under your wing. Dreampunk Press has a new author right now. Um, I love the story. I edited it. Um, it's a wonderful story. There's, there's a lot of good in there. There's a lot of reasons it fits very well with Dreampunk Press. Um, when, when you do that, though, yes, you. there's going to be um hiccups along the way and sometimes you know when you've got eight to ten years experience in there it it you have to kind of remind yourself what you were like ten or eight or six years ago um before you had some experience in that um and not take every question and every you know and because i said you know you know if you do ask somebody for advice you know don't Blast them afterwards and say, I think you're wrong. I mean, when you've asked for advice. Um, but as the person that is, you know, has the more experience, um, kind of remind yourself of what you might have been like when you first started. You thought you knew stuff because you read articles, you went to conferences, you were a member of SCBWI, you read their stuff, you went to stuff, and you were told stuff. From you know, ten years ago, everything was traditional for SCBWI. Now they actually recognize self-published authors. Um, but you know, remember, and sometimes you've got to bite your tongue as the person with some of that knowledge, so that you're not scaring them off, you're not um, alienating them, because it's it's that fine balance between criticism that's constructive and encouragement that's not false praise. Michael. <sighs> I think um, no matter what you encounter when you're first starting out, um, just look at everything as a potential learning opportunity. And I think that because uh, because anything can be, and if if it, if it's something that's great, you know, take it to heart. And if if it's something that's um, 
if, if it's a negative experience, then think of like, what would you say to a younger version of yourself um, or your child um, or, or right. any like budding apprentice? And, and how would you, having gone through it, how would you um, try and help them out of it? And in a way, thinking about that, you can help yourself out of that situation in the moment. And uh, in terms of what you can do to help new authors, um, just uh, talk to people, make friends, and buy a book. Aaron. Uh, going back to our metaphor in regards to the, the maze and the dungeon and all that Thanks, stuff, <laughs> um, it, as Michael said, everything's a learning opportunity. You learn how to do something or you learn something that doesn't work at the moment. It may work in the future. Uh, but thinking back on that kind of metaphor, it, imagine you're teaching your younger brother or sister about a video game, but you don't want to give away the story. So you're giving them tips and for the walkthrough. And if we're playing a quest-based game, and say, hey, make sure to pick up the font of Endless Water. And they go, what What the hell is this crap artifact? I don't need this. And until they figure out that, oh, I'm fighting a fire demon 12 levels later. And it, you can't explain all that context early on because half of it you got to learn yourself. But the other half of it, you can just go, okay, hey, keep an eye on this. This is things that we want to shed uh and one of the ones i harp on is we don't want repetitive words because it creates a, a staccato in the brain it goes why does he keep saying this and it may only be two or three times over 300 pages but that's what keys it into the head robert jordan's she tugged her braid or she smoothed her skirt he doesn't actually say it all that often but man do people remember that mm. very good okay i'm gonna read evan's comments here and then I'm going to give my closing thoughts and then we'll be out of here. So um, Eben had said, remember Sturgeon's Law when you talk about putting out crap? Quoted from Wikipedia, Sturgeon's Revelation, as expounded by Theodore Sturgeon, referred to as Sturgeon's Law is an adage cited as 90% of everything is crap. Sentence derives from quotations by Sturgeon, an American science fiction author and critic, although Sturgeon coined another adage he termed Sturgeon Laws, the 90% crap remark became Sturgeon's Law. So the phrase was derived from Sturgeon's observations, while science fiction was often derided for its low quality by critics. Which, by the way, we lost Tempe. No, it does. Let me uh, fix that screen one second. <coughs> Jorp! There's Jorp. I will talk about you in a second, Jorp. Jorp, do me a favor. Type exclamation point me exclamation point m e everybody needs to go follow jorp up oh, tempe's back let me switch back to the other screen now i have no idea what happened uh, he, <laughs> stuff, he dozed off. stuff happened so anyhow um yeah science fiction was really heavily criticized when it stir first started coming to popularity um as just crap across the board but anyhow, derided for its low quality by critics, majority of examples of works in other fields could equally be seen to be of low quality. And science fiction was thus no different. In other words, 90% of everything is crap, not just what you got. There you go. Uh, it's, uh, now, my closing thoughts on this topic is, yes, help people. Um, but as somebody who is busy creating, gauge their level gauge what information they want or need um and here's what i'm going to tell to anybody who's just starting it out failing is valid learning okay that's how we learn go fail it is better to go out and fail than just not do because you're afraid i have seen so many people who are like I'm creating the world. I'm creating character backgrounds. I'm creating, I'm creating, I'm creating. You're not writing a book, though. And you're not going to write a book till you write a book. And that's the first piece of advice I give anybody who comes to me for advice is go write the book. I don't care if it's crap. I don't care if you're horrible with grammar and syntax and spelling. That's what editing is for. Go write a book. And from the other aspect... Don't expect a writer to give you their full time and attention when you don't even know them, especially if you're going to fight any advice or information they give you. So anyhow, guys, the person I mentioned last night that I was watching the writing stream and then did the anime was Channel Jorp right there, who hey. is in our chat. 
Uh, he has a sense of humor and a point of view very similar to ours here uh, in the tavern. So make sure you give him a follow. We are out of here. And I am going to do our outro music. <laughs> Constantly drop. Let's get our outro music. Guys, have a great one. Here's to your faces. Thank you for all your input, advice, and thoughts. Viewers Bye. and co-hosts. Night. Bye. Thank you for joining Roger Travis I. Sivar and the other writers, content creators, and all-around amazing people for our discussion here. Join us again soon, and until you do, make sure you create with passion, enjoy the journey, and remember, every night can be right. Good night, everybody. Hang out one second, guys.